Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of CCK Live. Today, I'm joined by Caitlin Degnan and Kevin Medeiros, and we're going to be breaking down the process of the current timeline of cases that go to the CAVC or the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to start off um, broad strokes. What is the CAVC? So it was a court that was established by Congress in 1988 to oversee VA decision making and basically to ensure that VA is following the law. So practically what it allows is veterans to leave the VA system, right? Because every single decision that you get at VA until you get to the court is made by VA. The rating decision is made by VA. The final board decision is a VA adjudicator. This lets you go outside of VA in order to try to challenge a denial of benefits. So it's a federal court in Washington, D.C. that reviews final board decisions um, and claimants, appellants, veterans are allowed to appeal to that court. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more specificity about this in the, in the uh, later in the talk, but you can represent yourself, you can get a representative, but basically the court looks at your file. It looks at what's submitted to it, briefs, um, sometimes oral arguments, and it makes a decision in your case. Its job is to determine whether VA looked at the right facts and used the right law in adjudicating your case. The only thing that I want to hit really quickly on the outset before I turn it over to Caitlin and Kevin is that when you get to the CABC, you can't submit new evidence like you can at some points in the process at the VA. The court looks just at what the board looked at when it made its decision, which is your C file or referred to when you get to court as a record before the agency. So you can't file a brief and staple a new medical examination to it or something like that. It's just going to look at the record before the agency. So that's a little bit about the court. That's just scratching the surface about the process. So, Caitlin, you want to talk a little bit more specifically about who's making these decisions at the CAVC? So when you have your case at the CAVC, um, those cases are decided by judges. And these are independent judges. They're not VA employees. They're appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. So it's not a VA employee who's going to be making the decision here. It's going to be an independent judge. Typically, cases are usually decided by a single judge, but sometimes they might also be decided by a panel of judges, which is three judges or all of the judges. At this time, the court has nine permanent active judges and then a number of retired judges that help out. Um, and can be asked to come back and serve when necessary. And typically these judges are gonna serve for a term of 15 years. They will issue decisions on all kinds of benefits issues. So disability compensation, educational assistance, survivor benefits and pension benefits, any decision by the Board of Veterans Appeals that is appealed to the court, that's these judges are gonna rule on them. Right, and the distinction between these judges and the veterans law judges that are making the final board decision is particularly important. There are different types of judges. It's not a VA judge that's making a decision in your court appeal. So one of the things we wanted to hit right off the bat, something that I would be thinking about if I were a veteran um, or a claimant watching this video is what's the court appeal gonna get me? Kevin, do you wanna get into a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, Christian, this is a, a big question for a lot of veterans. and in the over, overwhelming majority of cases, the outcome from the court is, is what is known in legal terms as a remand. That means the case is sent back to the board for re-adjudication, reconsideration, for it to make a new decision based on the errors that have been identified um, you know, by the parties, by the judge in the case and, and the CAVC. Um, for the board to make a new decision that complies with, with the outcome of the court appeal. Um, in some instances, if the court does um, you know, not agree with the veteran's position, they might affirm the board's decision, leading to um, you know, the, the board's denial of, of the claim that's being sought becoming final. Um, and then also in rare occasions, the court might reverse a board decision um, and, and order the agency to... Uh, um, you know, grant benefits, but those are very rare occasions. Um, the overwhelming majority of the time, like I said, the court will identify legal errors that the board made and send it back to the board for a new decision that corrects the legal errors. 
right? One of the things that I like to make very clear to my clients right from the outset is a favorable result, a really good result is getting the case from the court back down to the board, right? Because like you said, Kevin, in the majority of cases, that is the court's role. It's to point out to the board, the VA, what it did wrong and what law it needs to follow the next time it takes up the decision. Because in a very small percentage of cases, does the court actually grant benefits? So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the CABC process. So that's what you're going to get. Um, obviously, that's very general. Um, but Kaylin, you want to hit a little bit about the timeline before we sort of get into the A to Z, how the court appeal works? Of course. Unfortunately, the, you know, the timeline of the process can really vary based on a number of factors. So if you, you know, you go through the process and you're able to obtain what's called a PBC or a pre-briefing conference remand, that process is only going to take you about six to eight months. Um, and that's, that's usually the quickest that these cases can resolve. Um, alternatively, if the case has to go through the full briefing process, you're really looking at 12 to 18 months before we reach a decision from the court. Um, and of course, that can vary, but on average, we'll see about 12 to 18 months. Um, another caveat to that is that if the case goes to a panel of judges and is going to have an oral argument, that's going to result in a precedential decision most of the time. And those, those can take quite a bit longer, you know, 18 months, two years, depending on, um, you know, a number of factors. And then another exception to this is also stayed cases. So if there is a case that is going to be precedential, um, that involves an issue that is similar to what's going on in your case, sometimes either VA or even your attorney could ask to what's called stay the case. And it basically puts a pause on the case until that precedential decision is decided. Um, and sometimes that can take quite some time. We've seen, you know, cases get stayed for a year or so. Um, and you're not going to get a resolution in that case until the case um, that's precedential is decided. Um, but on average, the court is going to come to a decision on a case within 12 to 18 months. Um, but some cases can take as long as two years if those factors that I mentioned earlier are involved. Right. And of course, at CCK, <clears throat> as advocates, we obviously try to get a decision as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's only so much we can do to move the case along. So I'm, we're going to sort of take a little bit of a step back here. We're going to talk about the process A to Z. So what would it look like if you uh, went to court? What would it look like if you got CCK as your representatives in court? So <clears throat> like we said, I'll start this off and then I'll pass it between Caitlin and Kevin because it's a little bit of a long process. And that's the reason why it can take 12 to 18 months. So you get the board decision in the mail, hopefully. Um, you look at the board decision. You don't like what it did. It denied you service connection. So like we said, you have... Um, the right to appeal that denial to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, to the CAVC. It's not going to be a part of the VA anymore. You're going to a specialized federal court where federal judges are going to, um, if it goes all the way to briefing, make a decision in your case. It's not up to VA and the board, once it gets to the CAVC, what's going to happen in your case. That's basically what happens at every step before you get to the CABC, but that's not the case once you get to federal court. So the first thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to file a notice of appeal of that board decision with the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims within 120 days of the board decision. So that's really important because um, you know there's always except there's exceptions to every rule, but if you file it outside of the 120 day time period, you might have a really hard time getting your case heard. So. 120 days, um, get your appeal filed. So the next thing that's going to happen, this is sort of, you know, just going over the broad strokes. This is a, a, a action that the clerk's going to take, which is a person who basically deals with all the court cases. They're going to docket it. And what that means is your case is going to get on the CABC's website. It's going to get on the court's um, case listing. And they're basically going to tell everyone, okay, your case has been docketed. Um, and here's what's going to happen in the next steps. So basically, you already have your board decision, right? You've already appealed your board decision, but the first step is for the secretary to find it and then to put it on the docket, throw it on the docket. So within 30 days of filing that appeal, 
the VA has to give you, has to give the court the uh, decision that you're appealing. Um, then after that, the VA is going to choose an attorney from its Office of General Counsel to represent the secretary, represent the government's position in this case. So that will be who you're going against at the CAVC. So unlike VA, where the process is not adversarial, right, and the VA is supposed to help you in developing your claim, once you go to federal court, it becomes an adversarial process and you'll be going up against um, a VA attorney. So, Kevin, do you want to pick it up from um, the next step in the process, the RBA? Yeah, sure. So at that point, the VA's attorney is going to send um, what Christian referred to earlier is, is called the RBA, the record before the agency. It's everything that's been associated with a veteran's um, file um, up until the board has made its decision. And that, at that point, the record becomes closed and it's referred to as the record before the agency. And the court will um, uh, only be able to look and, and advocates will only be able to use what's in the, the record before the agency at the time the board made its decision. So um, after the veteran or, or their advocate has had a chance to take a look at that the RBA and make sure everything um, is there, the court will issue a 60-day notice to file brief. Um, and from that time, uh, from the date that that notice to file brief has been issued, the, um, the veteran or the advocate will have 60 days to file a formal brief with the court. But in situations where a veteran is represented by an attorney um, or another, another uh, practitioner before the court, the court will schedule what's called a pre-briefing conference, a PBC that we've, we've also mentioned previously, um, that will allow the, veteran, the veteran's attorney or, or representative and the VA's attorney to get together with a, an attorney from the court uh, who kind of acts as the moderator of the, of the, the phone call and uh, see if they can figure out a way to resolve the appeal without having to file a formal brief with the court and letting a judge decide the case, which as we've spoken about, can really drag on the, the length of the appeal. Um, so the, the goal is to re resolve the case, hopefully at that, at that stage, at, um, during that, that phone call. Um, and if not, then that is when the, the formal briefs are filed with the court and um, a judge ultimately decides the case. So Right. So <clears throat> up until that PBC stage is what you were talking about, Caitlin, it takes about six to eight months, right? So if you aren't able to come to an agreement with a VA attorney at the conference stage or sort of at that early stage, then it's when we gonna get, we're going to get into a process that's maybe going to take between 12 and 18 months, maybe a little bit longer. So do you want to get into a little bit about how sort of the briefing process works um, at the CABC? Yeah, so if you're unable to resolve your case at the pre-briefing conference, then the case is going to go to brief. And one of the reasons why this process can be so lengthy is that you know, everyone gets a, a set amount of time to do everything. So initially, the appellant is going to have either 60 days from the briefing order or 30 days after the PBC in order to file their brief. Um, appellants can ask for a 45-day extension. A lot of times that's really helpful for making sure um, that you're really thoroughly addressing your case. Um, so we usually like to plan, okay, that 45-day extension is going to happen. Then at that point, VA will have an opportunity to respond to your brief. They initially get 60 days um, to write that brief, and they also can ask for 45 days of extension. Um, and I think it's, I, you know, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's our experience that they will take that extension in most cases. So it's a really good idea to plan for that. And then you get to file what's called a reply brief, right? The appellant gets to have the last word in there and respond to whatever VA raised in their brief. Initially, you have 14 days to file that reply, but again, you do have a 45-day extension available to you. Um, and a lot of times it can be advisable to take that to make sure that you're being very thorough in your arguments. Once all of that has been completed, the case is going to get assigned to a judge and that judge is gonna render a decision. Um, and as Kevin mentioned earlier, the court either affirms or vacates the board's decision and remands the case back down to the board. 
And then again, in very rare cases, the court can reverse the decision, which means it'll send the case back down to the board with instructions to change a finding or grant whatever the benefit is that is sought. But again, that's very rare occurrence. Right. So vacate would mean the court uh, basically agrees that the that the board made an error, erases the board's decision practically, not literally, and then sends it back down to VA for a new decision. Remand is like what Kevin explained, so I'll just hit it really quickly as a reminder. It's going to go back to VA for them to correct their errors, issue, issue a new decision. Another thing that I like to make crystal clear to my clients is that getting it back to the court is... Um, <clears throat> is a, a, a great result because the alternative is if it's affirmed, your denial is is set in stone um, or, you know, it's just it, the court appeal isn't going to lead to you getting another shot at it. But it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get benefits. But what it does is you get an order when you go to court, uh, a federal judge explains to the board in painstaking detail exactly what it did wrong and what VA did wrong and what it has to do now that it has the case back. Um, and it gives a great roadmap um, for the board to use, hopefully, when it takes the decision up again. So <clears throat> one thing we wanted to also note is if you lose at the CAVC, if the CAVC affirms the board's decision, you're not done. You have more options um, available to you to uh, continue on in trying to, to convince the court or another court, and I'll get into that, that the board made an error. So you can file what's called a motion for recon at the court. Um, there you explain to the judge why you think that maybe there was something about the argument or the case that they didn't, um, you know, fully look into or for the fully recognize from the pleadings and just take another look at it. Reconsider your decision. See if you uh, see if you still, in light of what um, an advocate raises or a veteran raises, um, believe that the board's decision should be affirmed. You can request panel consideration, which basically asks the judge um, to see if maybe they have created a new a new ruling that um, you know uh, maybe hasn't been a part of the court's precedent before, or takes a different position on a case that maybe the precedent is um, you know says that they shouldn't do. So you ask for a panel. The judge will see if some of his his or her colleagues agree that panel is necessary. And if they do, then like I think, Caitlin, you went over this quickly at the beginning. You know, three judges or more are going to take up the case and they're going to decide whether the board decision should be affirmed or whether it's something that should be remanded. And then um, in a very, very, very small percentage of cases, you can appeal a CAVC case to the federal circuit, which is the court that has jurisdiction to oversee the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, but that's pure legal errors only. The federal circuit doesn't deal in facts. Um, it's a very difficult court to practice in front of, and it's a very small percentage of cases um, that are or even filed and even fewer are successful at the CABC. Um, so that's kind of the process. Uh, one of the things that I you know, if, if I were a veteran, I was watching this, I would want to know, how much is this going to cost me? Um, Kevin, do you want to go through that a little bit? Yeah, like like most courts in the country, I would say the, there's a filing fee to, to have your case heard at the CABC, and, and that's $50. Um, uh, and, you know, veterans can, if they cannot afford the $50 filing fee, can file a declaration of financial hardship which then the court will, will review and waive the, the filing fee. So um, one or the other, either the $50 filing fee or the DFH, as it's called. Um, as far as, you know, veterans who want attorney assistance or, you know, other uh, practitioner assistance at the court, at CCK, veterans do not, um, do not need to pay attorney's fees. We um, CCK is compensated if they're successful in the appeal um, under a law called the Equal Access to Justice Act or EJA, and that federal law um, allows for um, attorney compensation for the time they've spent working on the case um, in in situations where the attorney has been successful on in um, obtaining a successful outcome for the veteran during the appeal. So. Um, Court fees also do not affect a veteran's back pay if there is a retroactive 
award after the case has been returned to the board and maybe the board granted benefits and the veteran is expecting to receive um, retroactive benefits, the court fees would not uh, impact that at all. Right. So <clears throat> another question that I, I always like to try to put myself in the shoes of the, who's going to be watching this. Um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, representing yourself at court, getting someone who's accredited at court, um, someone who, who can practice before the court. Um, you know, I would want to think, do I need an attorney uh, once I get to the CABC? Um, so, no, the answer to that question is you don't need an attorney uh, to take your court to the United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Uh, it's referred to as representing yourself pro se. Um, the court has a whole process. They'll let you know about what's going on in the case. You can file an informal brief. They have a form that you can fill out. Um, the VA attorney will file a brief uh, arguing, um, you know, if they don't agree against your position. And the court will take up the case just like it would if you were represented, um, you know, uh, as if you were represented by an attorney. You definitely don't need it, but it would. we would, uh, you know, as someone who's been practicing in this practice area for seven years, I would recommend it. Um, you can proceed on your own, but you are going to go up against um, experienced VA attorneys who are who are you know well versed in VA law because that's that's their job. Um, you know, and also something that I always want to know when I'm talking about this is when you're working with an attorney who represents you at the Veterans Administration before VA, not all of those attorneys um, also work at the CABC. Um, like I said, Caitlin, Kevin, and I, that's our practice area where we practice in court attorneys. Um, we've represented, uh, Caitlin and Kevin have been here for, you know, a, a little, both over four years. I've been here for seven years. We've literally represented hundreds of people um, at the CABC. Um, you know, and there's, I think we're going to provide a link to our website where you can, uh, you know, check out some of our court wins um, that we've had over the years. Um, you know, Without a qualified representative at court um, identifying the legal issues, sometimes the very complex issues of, of regulatory and statutory interpretation, you know, there can be a disadvantage there. Um, and it would definitely, in, in our opinion, be a good idea to find someone who is well versed in those issues, just like the VA attorney is going to be. Um, and there's definitely, we have a blog post that you can look at um, to learn more about the benefits of a hiring an accredited representative for your appeal, hiring someone who can represent you before the CABC in your appeal, and you should definitely check that out. So unless you, Caitlin and Kevin, have anything to add, just want to thank you guys for tuning in today. Uh, more information about the CABC and the appeals process can be found on our blog and also make sure to stay up to date by subscribing to our channel and following us on safe social media. Thank you.